Good morning, everyone. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to the book of Jude. The book of Jude is just before the book of Revelations, if you're trying to find it. This week, as I was doing some of my devotions, I kind of read through this book and really it connected with something of what we've been teaching. Um, we've been talking about really building God's way for many weeks now. We looked at um, Proverbs 24. We talked about how we build a house with wisdom, but it also talked about the fact that we have to wage a good warfare. And uh, looked at the book of Ephesians and recognized that we need to know who our enemy is. We know where we're seated, we're seated in heavenly places because we've been saved. We also know that there's a place we need to stand in as we're doing our work. But we've also got to walk the walk. And, and I know Pastor Andrew covered in chapter 4 of Ephesians last week. You know, and it's very important for us, I think, as we do our walk of Christianity, that we recognize that there's a, there's a, a responsibility that we have. And, you know, when we look at this book of Jude, it's only 25 verses, but it's chock full, uh, you know, with, with um, exhortation. And, you know, sometimes we could actually look at this, and, and I would say there's a, there's a way not to build, or there's a way to destroy, and there's also a way to build. And if we were to look at this book, we could say that it, it describes those two things. But I could also say that it's a warning against nominal Christianity, you know, that nominal Christianity, which is kind of a strange word in a sense, because you wonder whether a nominal Christian is a Christian at all, but it's an enemy of the church. Jesus warned against nominal kind of spiritual lifestyle when he quoted from Isaiah 29, 13 in Mark 7, 6, and he said this, he answered and said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, I know that this doesn't happen to any of us here, where we're worshiping the Lord and we're thinking about, you know, whether our car is getting wet today or something else, you know. And so, you know, we, we obviously want to reach unreached people groups all around the world, and yet some of the most difficult people to reach are what we would consider nominal Christians. Jude here understood the principle and he was very concerned with encouraging believers to avoid this sort of satanic trap of becoming merely nominal Christians. And, and like Peter, Jude believed that the best defense against nominalism and against false teaching was really a strong offensive dynamic faith in Jesus Christ. And so we, we need to contend earnestly for our faith. And this is what James is saying here. And, and Jude, I'm sorry. And we're going to look at, beginning in these first three verses, if you found it at this point, the epistle of Jude. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude identifies himself here first as a servant of Jesus Christ and then as the brother of James. And this greeting really reflects the the humble spirit and the authentic priority of his life as he presents this word. And his highest calling and privilege was to be a servant of Jesus Christ, not to be called the brother of James. And if Jude's brother was the same James who authored the epistle bearing his name and who was leader of the early church, then Jude was not only the brother of James, but he was also the half-brother of Jesus. And yet, he didn't glory in that fact. He was content to be called the servant of Jesus and the brother of James. His attitude was a lot like Andrew, 
who consistently referred to in the scripture as the brother of Peter. Jude here greets those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. And the word that Paul uses in the writing to the church in Rome when he states that we're called of Jesus Christ and called to be saints is this Greek word kletos, which means to be called. And he says here you are sanctified. In other words, you have been set aside, preserved by Jesus Christ. How many of you are happy that you've been set aside and preserved by Jesus Christ today? And this Greek word translated as preserved means to be kept or, or to be reserved. And, and what a marvelous promise we have in the scriptures here that God would keep us. You know, that, that it's one thing for us to, to sort of try to keep ourselves. It's another thing for God to keep us. Our Lord has called us, he's sanctified us, and he's promised to keep us in his love and his power. And after these wonderful words of affirmation, Jude extends his greeting, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And this is obviously a, a genuine Christian greeting used similar forms by many of the Christian writers uh, of the scriptures. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, for instance, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, when he says to be multiplied to you, it kind of means that you keep growing in these aspects. You know, that you grow in the aspect of mercy, that you grow in the aspect of peace, that, that you continue to grow in this aspect of love. And then Jude moves on to why he's writing this letter at all in the first place. And he admits that he hoped to write to them just concerning their common salvation. However, he heard and about this need that they were facing, and it says in verse 3, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once and for all delivered for the saints. Jude has really two major concerns here. One of them is this, that the, that the church doesn't drift, and that also would not be led astray by false teachers. Kind of two concerns, you know, that there's this idea that sometimes in our own lives we, we sort of drift away. It's not that somebody leads us, that that's kind of our own selfish ambition or our own lust, sort of cause us to drift away from the one that did the saving for our lives. The other part, though, is we can also be led astray by false teaching. And so he's addressing these two things. And in reality, in these verses from 4 to 19, I could put sort of a title, Don't Be a Destroyer. God's calling us to build his way, but when we look at these verses, we really learn these are ways that we don't build, but we destroy. It's a kind of a long and difficult discourse. In fact, sometimes when I look at this, I say, boy, what a, did, did he have a bad day? You know, James begins to hit bang, 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 bang. You know, 20 different descriptions of false teachers. And I'm thinking, you know, sometimes you just come home from a day's work and it's like, you just can't believe some things that go on. And here he's going to hit against false teachers and those who divide the body of Christ, those who would seek to destroy the faith of believers rather than build it up. And I think sometimes all of us kind of shake our heads and say, why in the world, who in the world would do this kind of a thing? And it says this in verse 4, these destructive men, I guess we could say women as well, right? Because we like to always be included, you know, have crept into the church unnoticed, which is an amazing thing. And they've turned the grace of our God into license and deny the only Lord God. Now, in studying this passage, I think it's helpful to divide all the materials into sort of two categories. The first exposes the characteristics of these ungodly men and distinctives of their false teaching. The second would expose the judgment which God is going to bring upon them and all who follow the evil way. So, first of all, we're going to be looking at this characteristics of ungodly men or the distinctive of this false teaching. But I would like to do this as we do this. It's easy for us to look at somebody else and say, these, yes, these are the characteristics, I agree. Those are the characteristics of false teachers. Those are the characteristics of ungodly men. But I'd like us to do this as well. As we look at these characteristics, say, do I ever exemplify any of these characteristics? Is, is there something in me too that maybe, you know, as he's saying, I, I'm addressing you so you don't drift or you're led astray. 
You know, is there any tendency in me? Is there anything that, that I would portray that somebody else could look at and say, there's these marks in their life? And if there is, obviously, we, we should repent of them. We, we should ask God to help us to overcome. So, so here, the scripture tells us that what we know and what we say and what we do and, and what we are, all of those things are important. In other words, our, our conduct and speech do reveal our character. And Jude here is describing these characteristics of these ungodly men. At the same time, what he's trying to do is expose the false teaching that comes. And he blends their character and false teaching all together as he begins to expose them for who they are. Thank God we're not, we're not like any of these things, right? Amen. So let's follow this expose by clarifying at least actually 20 characteristics. So if some of you are writing notes, it's an awful lot, but I'll, I'll help you with the, the notes if you'd like. First in, in verse 4, they're ungodly. You know, God is the source of truth, amen? And, and those who would espouse non-truth cannot be of God. They would be ungodly. If you're speaking your own truth, that's not representing God. It's ungodly. Second thing is they turn the grace of God into license. In other words, how many know that grace is expensive? The grace of God was expensive. It, it was something that was bestowed on us as we live out this godly life of righteousness. But, but those who walk in sin would encourage us to misuse this grace as a means of license to live any way of immorality. But the grace of God was so expensive, it cost us the blood of Jesus Christ for our lives. And so we just can't walk any other way. It seems like, you know, we're living in a day and an age, and, and obviously Paul spoke about this about the last days, and, and others are addressing the same kind of an issue here, where, where we're looking at God's grace, and oh yes, we know that we're saved by God's grace, but then we sort of take it easy, don't we? Because God forgave us, we can sort of walk any way, which way we want to because he'll continue to forgive us. It's not the way that we're supposed to be taught and it's not the way we're supposed to walk. It says in verse 4, they deny the only Lord God in our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a litmus test, isn't it, for authentic Christianity is the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's not just that he's your savior, he's your Lord. And so if he's your savior, and then you're saying, you know, I think that God's saying this, but I'm going to, who's Lord? He or you? No one can be truly to, to God, acknowledge him as Jesus as Lord, if you're doing your own thing. In fact, no one can acknowledge him as Lord without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It says in verse 8, they're dreamers. And they defile the flesh. How tragic. Because sin always destroys and leads to ultimate death in our life. And, and those who walk in the flesh, rather than in the spirit, they're polluting their own bodies. And what a contrast to the biblical teaching here that our bodies are precious in the sight of God. In fact, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, they reject authority. Yeah, one of the great sins of our generation has been the sin of rejecting God's authority. And, and it's breaking down the first commandment that the Lord said, you shall have no other gods before me. But you know what God we put before him is ourselves. And unfortunately, this, this philosophy slips into the church because there are many people that don't want to live under the lordship of Christ and they also don't want to walk under the godly discipline of the church or the leaders. Verse 8, they speak evil of dignitaries. Love and respect for leaders is, is a high priority that God gives us in the church. And, and Paul teaches that we should esteem those who labor among us very highly in love in 1 Thessalonians 5.13. Also, the elders who rule well should be counted worthy of double honor in 1 Timothy 5.17. The, the writer of Hebrews instructs Christian, obey those who have rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls in Hebrews 13, 17. What, what a contrast though 
is the teaching of a false teacher who would lead us astray. They slander dignitaries. They even slander celestial beings. And, and we should be afraid. You know, the, these, these false teachers, as, as even Michael the archangel did not dare to bring a reviling against the Satan. James wrote, we should resist the devil and he will flee from us. Verse 10, they speak evil of whatever they don't know. <laughs> it's interesting to me too because so many people have attitudes and comments about things they have no understanding of. It's a trait of the natural sinful person to often speak most loudly and emphatically about that which he or she knows the least well or is least sure. And that, Jude says, is true of false teachers. Not only speak with loudness, they speak with evil. Verse 10, they're like brute beasts, they corrupt themselves. And, and so like, they're, he likens them to like irrational dumb animals. Without realizing it, they're, they're corrupting themselves. And this teaching is especially poignant when we recognize that one of the heresies of the false teachers was espousing would eventually become something known as Gnosticism. And Gnosticism was a, an early heresy that really contended, among other things, that the, the followers of Gnosticism were, were brilliant and elite and had some spiritual understanding. It's almost like, you know, you have these special prophecies and, and we'll follow these things and we're better than everyone else, you know. And we, we kind of sometimes divide the church into different groups, don't we? And as we're doing so, we, we're sort of, the group that we stand with, we sort of look down on others. I've seen this take place time and time again, you know, and it's like we're calling for unity, but at the same time we're dividing. The Gnostics had, they had this special revelation. Everyone else was like dumber than them. And somehow because of that, they stood out. And, and, and this is the kind of thing that false teachers do is they, they pull people to themselves because somehow they have this, this special knowledge. You know, the, the, the root here, when, when it speaks of, of brute beasts and they, they corrupt themselves, it talks about them being spots in the feast. And, 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 you know, when you look at this word spot, you could think of a stain, but really it also speaks of like a reef. It, it's, a, it, it's like a, um, a ledge or a reef, a rock in the sea. And so, you know, the, the warning is sort of explicit because just like the, the ship needs to avoid this, at sea, we need to avoid the trickery of false teachers because if we hit that reef, we're going to sink. Verse 12, they serve only themselves. It means in the idea of feeding or tending. It's a word Jesus, you know, when he dialogued with Peter, he said to feed my sheep. But, but false teachers feed themselves. In fact, you listen to their commentary, it's really all about them, isn't it? You know, that they come to the love feast. It's not to share communion with the fellowship with others. It's what they're going to get out of it for themselves. Verse 12, clouds without water. Again, Jude uses this analogy that Peter also makes reference to. But, you know, you, you see a cloud. If you're a farmer, you're looking at the cloud and you're saying rain's coming. But there's no rain to be had. A little use of that cloud. You know, it's just driven by the wind. It's sort of out of control. And he says in same verse 12 there, late autumn trees without fruit. Uh, you know what I'm saying is he's not having a, uh, to stretch for so many different descriptions here. Can you imagine all the things that James is just, is like a machine gun coming out with one thing after another thing. I wonder what kind of day he had. There are trees in late autumn, but they don't bear fruits. They're quite unlike the, those that abide in Christ, that abide and so they bear fruit in their season. Uh, they're not only fruitless, but he says they're doubly dead since they have no spiritual roots which they can draw up nourishment from Jesus Christ. They're like raging waves of the sea in verse 13. In other words, they're, they're like these wild waves, waves of the sea that turns up junk on the beach. They, they, they foam with, with foam, right? And, and so it's kind of like it says to their disgrace, to their shame, that here it is, they're making a big storm, 
but the end result of that storm is always sort of destruction. Verse 13, they're wandering stars. Now, I know there are a lot of people I know that seem like they're in orbit, um, but these stars have sort of gone out from their intended orbit. You know, and so it, it sort of says this is a great tragedy of a life of sin. It always takes you off course. You know, instead of enjoying what God has prepared for you and staying within the orbit of what God has, they veer off course. Verse 16. They're murmurers and complainers. I thank God none of us do that. You know, that, you know, those that are out of fellowship with God, when you stray from your intended orbit, you become complainers instead of praisers. The children of Israel praised God when they enjoyed fellowship with him, but they, they, they constantly murmured and complained when they strayed from him and they followed their own lusts. Verse 16 and 18, they walked according to their own lusts. Twice he describes these false teachers as those that walk according to their lust. And, and Peter really begs his readers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Unfortunately, these false teachers do not warn us against that kind of conduct. In fact, they practice it in their own lives. Verse 16, they mouth great swelling words. Some people can talk, can't they? They don't stop talking. They're boasters. They, they attempt to impress people. Not only with their bragging, but sometimes they use these big words that, that no one else can understand. But here, he's saying here that they, their mouth has these great swelling words. What effect is it having on us? Verse 16, they're, they're flattering people to take advantage. You know, and, the, and Proverbs sort of reveals this truth about flattery. In Proverbs 28, 23, it says, He who rebukes a man will find more favor afterward than he who flatters with the tongue. Not that we should speak truthfully. Verse, chapter 29, verse 5 of Proverbs says, A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his own feet. Yeah, the, the best... Flattery is really a form of lying since it's an exaggeration or distorted truth. Again, I'm glad none of us ever participate in things like that. But people use this. Evil people use it to deceive others so, so they can find their own advantage, you know. In verse 19, these are the ones who cause division. The spirit of the God is the only one that can bring unity to the members of the body of Christ. But those that walk according to their own lust, ungodly lust, are really the ones that cause division and they sort of cause a separation in the body. And whenever there's division in the body, you can be certain that the lust of the flesh is being expressed rather than the unity of the spirit. Verse 19 is sensual. To be sensual is to obviously live in the natural as opposed to living in the supernatural. It's to walk after the flesh rather than after the spirit of God for, for their, the, their foolishness to him. Nor could we know the things of God if they need to be spiritually discerned. Verse 19, uh, he concludes his 20th characteristics that they are not having the spirit. You really come to the summation statement of all that Jude's been teaching about false teachers here is the basic problem is spiritual. They don't have the Holy Spirit. And, and Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth and whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him according to John 14, 17. And, and he said in John 16, 13, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. So if the Holy Spirit is the, the source of our truth, as, a, as well as the revealer of truth, those that acknowledge him as Jesus as Lord, the Bible says is controlled by the Holy Spirit. But those who walk after the flesh do not have the Spirit. So they cannot teach truth. 
Can I also say that if we don't walk according to the Spirit, if, if we are in fact saved, if we are in fact filled with the Spirit, but we don't walk according to the Spirit, then we're going to walk in the flesh. And we're going to walk as if we don't even have the Spirit of God. You cannot do, and I cannot do, the ministry of what Christ has given us to do in our own strength. An effective spiritual ministry always takes place through a human vehicle. We're the clay. He's the potter. We're, we're, we're the vessel, but he is the treasure within the vessel. And so unless we're living under the lordship of Jesus Christ and ministering by his grace, by his power through the Holy Spirit, we're walking in the flesh. And those who don't have the spirit or those that don't walk in the spirit really become false teachers and they need to be accountable. After exposing these characteristics of false teachers, Jews begins very specifically about the judgments which will come upon those who walk according to their own ungodly lusts and who seek to lead others astray. And it's kind of important for us to look at because sometimes when we think in terms of our own Christianity, we, we think that this, this sort of cheap grace covers us from doing anything we want to do and we don't realize that God is a just judge. It said in verse 5 that, you know, that the Lord destroyed those who didn't believe. And Jude reminds the readers here of how the Lord dealt with unbelievers in the past. And he actually used the example of the children of Israel. Now we know the children of Israel were called and they were set apart and they were, they, they, they were delivered from Egypt. And yet, while they were being led by Moses, the Lord destroyed those who didn't believe. We know of the ten the 12 spies. We know of the 10 spies that gave a wrong report. We know how they, the, the, the children of Israel walked in their own lust and how God brought a condemnation on them because of that. The Bible says that all of them from 20 years of old and older died in the wilderness in that 38 years. There's more than 600,000 men and if you double that with women, you have like between 1.2, 1.3 million people that came from Egypt that were at that time brought under this judgment that were over 20 years old. If you take the 30 years, 38 years that they walked and you divide that, you find that 90 people a day were dying. Always a reminder of them, the fact that God is a just judge, that he does do what he's called to do. And, and Jude here is ultimately saying that God will destroy those, you know, of the contemporary day that don't believe, that don't walk according to the call of what God has given. He even speaks about angels, those disobedient who, who now walk under darkness and judgment until the great day. He then speaks about the vengeance of eternal fire. We hear the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and how that's been a, a something for us to see that, that there's an eternal judgment coming. One whole city that, that came under the judgment of God that no longer exists and how someday he's going to come back to judge the living and the dead. It says in verse 11, woe to them. And he declares this, woe to those who speak evil about things they don't understand, uh, who, who think only in the natural realm, who literally corrupt themselves. And he uses three Old Testament examples. He uses Cain, Balaam, and Korah. He says, don't walk in the way of Cain or the arrow of Balaam or, or the, the rebellion of Korah. You know, you, you look at all of these things and, 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 you know, Cain was someone that God put a mark on after he had murdered his brother, but Cain still chose to walk away from God. Balaam, well, he was like sort of religious, but he used his religious position as a way to make gain. So he walked in error, Quora, completely in rebellion. And all of them were destroyed. All of them were brought under judgment because of their disobedience. And he said, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So, so Jude here is referring obviously to false teachers as stars that have gone astray, that have moved out of their orbit, and he states that the blackness or darkness has been reserved for them forever. We see throughout Scripture we find sin and disobedience 
as a, a sort of light because God refers to Jesus as the true light who came to give light to every person. But the darkness did not comprehend it in John 1. And Jesus called himself the light of the world in John 9, 5. And, and he declared that people lived in darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. I guess it's a choice for us, right? That we can walk in this light or we can expose, instead of being those that expose the light, we expose darkness. And, and he says in, in verse 14 and 15 that the Lord's going to come and execute judgment on all who are ungodly. I think it's important that we, we present this side of the message because it's good to do all the happy things. You know, tomorrow is a great day and you're going to love your Lord and you can do whatever you want to do and you can live your life and thank God he's, he's, he's saved you and, you know, you don't need to be different than the rest of the world and don't worry, God's, you know, he's got you and, and he's never going to bring some correction to your life. But we see big difference here in the scripture, don't we? You know, here Judas warning, he said, look, there is a judgment of God. There is a day coming where he's going to judge the earth and he's going to judge all of us. Now, now I'm, I'm not saying about salvation here. I, I'm talking about the deeds that you do and, and how many of us, if we are saved and we're walking different than what we claim salvation is, are we in fact walking as Christians? Or are we just nominal Christians? If we're nominal Christians, are we even Christians? Good question. Verse 20 to 25, he really talks, here's where he talks about how we can build. This is the message here of the scripture because God's called us to be builders, right? He hasn't called us to be destroyers. No one's answering me. You're, you're, you're still under the condemnation of the first set of descriptions, right? Sin brings destruction, but spiritual life brings growth and it brings building. And after condemning the false teachers who would destroy and tear down, Jude instructs us to build ourselves up spiritually. And in other words, if we're joined with somebody that's always sort of tearing down, I think it's time we expose that. He's instructing us here how to build ourselves up. We're builders, aren't we? I got a few. Are you a destroyer or a builder? Do you want to be a destroyer or a builder? All right, so we learned ways we can destroy. Let's learn some ways we can build. He says here, we're builders, and he gives us actually six different ways we build. We build ourselves up in our most holy faith, verse 20. Faith is vital and essential to life of spiritual growth. Without faith, we can't please God. Amen? God calls us to be people that walk by faith. And, and Paul and the writer of Hebrews quoted from Habakkuk 2.4 when he declared the just shall live by faith. Okay, and so this holy faith denotes that there's a separate, distinct, utterly different aspect of our life. It comes from God. It flows back to God. We walk by faith. Paul writes in Romans 10, 17, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And this is the faith that's lived out through an act of obedience. It's not something that we have a knowledge of and we can quote, but, but it should have an effect on our lives. He goes on, a second aspect, he says, in praying in the Holy Spirit. He's encouraged us, if you're going to be a builder, you need to walk by faith, but you also need to be praying in the Holy Spirit. Because the battle against false teaching is not going to be won just by argument or intellect. We know that the scripture says in Ephesians 6, 12, we do not wrestle against flesh, and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. God has given us spiritual weapons 
to use, but, but in order for us to refute this error, but in, in growing and also in building together because one of God's greatest gifts that is given to us as his children is prayer. Prayer is spiritual. The Holy Spirit desires to empower us to pray. And he wants us to make intercession for us according to the will of God. It's through prayer that we understand his will. It's through prayer that we get the revelation of his will. So he asks us to walk by faith and to pray in the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 21, to keep ourselves in the love of God. If we're going to be builders, we need to be lovers. Love of God needs to flow from himself to us. And, and Paul's teaching us clearly here about the relationship of love and building. You know, when we see in Ephesians 4 that we're supposed to speak the truth in love, what's the whole goal? So we can grow up in maturity into Christ that had, you know, so that the whole body can begin to edify itself in love. And Paul declares this in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge puffs up, but love builds. Or edifies. I know so many people that have so much knowledge, but they don't have love. Jesus said, Abide in my love in John 15, 9. And then in John 15, 10, he says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. This is the truth of what Jude is teaching here. He's saying, Church, Christians, Stay in the bounds of God's love. Don't be like one of these stars that gets out of orbit. Enjoy the love of God. Share the love of God with others. Then in verse 21, he says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ is something that we need to enjoy day by day. As Jeremiah wrote in Lamentations 3, "Through through the Lord's mercies, we're not consumed. Speaking of his mercies, he's saying, they're new every single morning. Thank God for his mercy. Jews reminding us of God's ultimate mercy. His ultimate mercy is what enables us to have eternal life. And we're waiting and we're looking forward to this gift of his mercy. And with our eyes on this goal and we're enjoying the daily mercies of God, we're not apt to be led astray by false teachers. We're not using those mercies to sort of, you know, make us so that we're not distinctive. No, we understand the mercies of God. We come before the cross. We understand that we're nothing apart from him. And then verse 22 says we need to have compassion Because this mercy of God should be something we just enjoy, but we share with other people. The the same word compassion is often translated mercy. You know, uh, Peter uses it when he talks about in 1 Peter 2.10, you who once were not a people, but now you're the people of God. I mean, we once walked in darkness, but now we've been translated into the kingdom of his light. Why? By God's mercy. And though we we walk with God through faith in Jesus Christ, we do this through receiving his mercy. And we need to share that mercy with those that go astray. Jude tried to state this, that we need to make a distinction. In other words, we, we need to attempt to reach out with mercy and compassion to those that are a little bit out of their orbit. We need to rescue them. Rescue them from the error of false teaching. And our deepest concern should be not condemning people, but helping to restore them to the fellowship of Christ and his church. Verse 23 says, by saving others with fear. All of these things, we're, we're, we're praying in the Holy Spirit, we're walking by faith, we're, we're showing this mercy, we're, we're doing all of these things. And, and this act of mercy should be so far to attempt us to snatch people from the fire of judgment. The ministry of rescuing those who are strayed from the faith, this is a vital ministry. We've been reconciled so we can be reconcilers. And in his closing words, he he speaks about this important ministry, this act of of mercy, of reaching out to snatch others from the fire, should be done with fear. Paul teaches us in Galatians 6, 1, 
You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And that's where the, the idea of mercy and forgiveness should come into our lives to say that if it wasn't for what God did, who would I be? So we see here that we need to do this. People need to be snatched out of the fire of hell. That, that They need to be come to a place where we need to do it through love and compassion for the sinner at the same time having a hatred for sin, hated, hatred for the garment that's defiled by the flesh. We're called to be like Jesus. Jesus had a reputation for being a friend of sinners, but he hated the sin. He came to be our savior to rescue us from sin. These couple of last verses that Jude writes in this short letter uh, are best known, probably most quoted in of all of the epistles. It's a final word to us as Christians living in, in our, on escaping from the era of false teaching because he, he focuses this prayer squarely on God. And he says that he is the one who is able to keep you from stumbling. And he is the one who will present you faultless before the presence of his glory and eternal joy. See, our trust needs to be in him. We, we should receive him as our savior, follow him as our Lord. It's a day-to-day -day decision that we make. Yes, we need to deny ourselves and we need to take up our cross daily and we need to follow him. He's to be trusted with our very lives. He's not just our savior, he's our Lord. And we should follow him by faith, by, by praying in the Holy Spirit, by keeping ourselves in the love of God, by, by receiving his mercy, by having compassion on those who have gone astray, attempting to snatch them from the fire of judgment. And Jude closes with this highest tribute to God as a reminder to us of who he is and who we are as a result. It says, to God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Is he your savior? Do you see him as wise? Do you ascribe to him his glory and majesty? Do you recognize his dominion and power in your life? These are the things that Jude says are what keep us. Look, there's a lot of descriptions that we looked at today. This was a chock full for one message, 25 verses of scripture. And I can just imagine, I, I, sometimes as a pastor, I feel like those days, man, where I could rattle off a whole bunch of, you know, and I, it's almost like he, he was looking at the church and saying, how do we let this happen? How do we let this happen? Paul says the same thing when he's talking to the Ephesian church. He says, while I was with you night and day, I didn't give a prayer. I, I, I didn't hold anything back. I told you the truth. But I'm telling you, when I leave, there'll be those that will rise up among you. They'll be like savage wolves. And they won't be sparing the flock. In other words, their intention is not for you. It's for themselves. Jews given the same warning. There are many people. They look like they're a cloud. They have no water. They look like a tree, but they have no fruit. They look like a shining star, but they're really out of their orbit. There's a lot of things going on here. They create waves in the sea, but all they do is bring destruction. Beware. At the same time, isn't it admonition for us to walk in the spirit and not walk in the flesh so that we don't see the destruction of the flesh but we can see the primary goal of walking in the spirit so that we can walk in unity. So we're not grumblers and complainers, but we're praisers before our holy God. God wants to be praised. I think sometimes we're so, I spoke last week in New Hampshire about how, you know, we just get so used to certain things that we don't, really honor what needs to be honored. We, we, we lack honor and, and we ascribe lesser to those things that we do. We come to church, yes, we, we maybe sing the songs, but 
We're, we're singing lifeless songs. It's not that the song is lifeless. It is that our mind's not quite there. We get half a heart, half a mind, half a half half a um, ear, half half a mouth. <laughs> you know. But God wants us to walk with an appreciation for all that He's given to us, and for us to identify. You know, is there someone trying to talk to us, murmuring, complaining for things they don't know? Don't go that way. It just brings division. Let's bring about unity. Let's help ourselves in our own speech so that what we do, what we say, lines up with what we do, that there's integrity there. May the Lord work in our lives so that we can not only just identify, but also walk in these principles that God's given to us. Lord, we come before you today because you're our Savior. Because you alone are wise. That all glory and majesty, dominion and power belong to you now and forever. We give you our worship. We give you our lives. And Lord, if any of these descriptions caused us to say, ouch, Let's not just walk out of here with a cut. Let's come to you right now and ask you, Lord, to bring healing to our lives so that we can walk in a fruitful way, bring an honor and glory to your name. So we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.